When I was a kid, uh, my brother told me something that I really loved. I was a little kid. He told me about the do-over rule. What that meant was, if I was playing marbles or something and I made a bad shot, we could do the do-over rule and I could get another shot. I could take what I'd done wrong and make it right. Uh, or get an opportunity to make it right. And so I love the do-over rule, and so uh, as kids will sometimes do, once you find out something you like, uh, I used to do over rule of the places. Uh, as I started growing, we would play Monopoly. And uh, I always land, wanted to land on free parking. You know, I wanted that lot of money there in the middle. And so if it, I was coming around through there, and, and I would want it, and I'd roll the dice, and I didn't get it, I'd say, do over! And I, and I have a do over. And then I found the do over rule was, was really handy because we were all times outside playing and sports and things, and, and we would play horse, the basketball game where you follow the shot, you, you make a, one person makes a shot and another person don't make it. And I missed the shot, of course, because I was the youngest at the time. And, uh, and I'd say, do over, and I'd get another shot at it. Most of the time that didn't help me. But uh, I love the do over rule. Uh, but then uh, one day I learned a terrible truth. As I'd gotten older, uh, my, my brother had taught me that rule when I was real little, so I could, you know, have another chance. But as I got older, uh, he said, there's no such thing as a do-over rule. I like the do-over rule. Uh, and, and so uh, it disappointed me. Uh, but my disappointment turned to joy when I was about 21. I met and started dating this young lady. See her prom picture? Right, one of our prom pictures, I should say, and uh, she, was, she was pretty, wasn't she? That's what I thought back then, that's what I think today. And uh, so we started dating, and, and uh, so she was working at the Burger Den, used to be out in Chatsworth Highway, and uh, working at night. For some reason, I don't remember why I carried her to work, uh, or driven her to work, and uh, we just started dating. And there, in the Burger Inn parking lot, we had our first kiss. <laughs> A celebrated day. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. But, but then, after it was over with, she said, can we do that over? <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> she wanted to make sure it was just right. It, it, was, it was all right with me the first time, but I enjoyed it the second time too. And we still enjoy those uh, as often as possible. I don't know where she's at. I'm looking for her. <laughs> but uh, the doodle rule. I was encouraged, but I found a girl would like to do over the road. Wouldn't it be great if in life you had a do over the road that you could erase the habits and mistakes of the past by starting over? You could think about how things would be different. And of course you wouldn't want to change the good, but you would like to change some of the, the bad. Yeah. Well, good news. The dual rule is what Easter is all about. Jesus went to the cross. He died on the cross for our sin. Some people like to call those just mistakes, but they're more than mistakes. They separate us from God. He died on the cross for that. He took our sins. Paid the penalty for them. 
which is death. And then went to the grave, and on the third day he arose again. Now the reason he arose is because he had committed no sin. He was a perfect sacrifice. And so he rose to give us new life. To give us a do-over. And uh, so that's why we celebrate Easter. Uh, so here's our takeaway thought today. Jesus gives anyone a do-over. Anyone. We learned that song when the kids, red, yellow, black, and white, they are all precious in the sight. Well, it doesn't just go for race. It goes for every social economic background, every sin that could possibly ever be committed, he already took that penalty for that sin. So anyone can have a duo. And that's really what today's all about. Jesus gives anyone a duo. Jesus gives anyone a duo. Jesus gives anyone a duo. He wants to be a good duo. He wants you to experience that. And so today we're going to look at a man named Peter who experienced the do-over after Christ's resurrection. Luke chapter, uh, I'm sorry, Mark. Is it Mark or Luke? I forgot what it was. Luke, uh, Mark. I read it in different uh, Gospels. Peter had been the unofficial leader of the disciples. He was the outspoken one. And they naturally followed him. And Jesus was telling them that the sheep would be scattered, speaking of them, when the shepherd was attacked. And here's Peter's response. He says, even if everyone else deserts you, I never will. I never will. And Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, Peter, this very night before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. You will deny me. Did you even know that? Jesus was arrested that night. And he went through a long night, six trials in all, that he went before, six trials that he went through that night. And Peter followed from this and denied it three times. And, uh, but here's what Peter responded to that. Said, no, no. He declared emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I will never deny you. And all the others. Out the same. They're always just following Peter. And so Peter made this big declaration about how that he would never do this thing. Well, our story today picks up after the cross, after the burial, after the resurrection. Jesus has appeared to the followers twice. But this guilt and directionlessness was still hanging over Peter's head. You see, uh, he, he, couldn't, he couldn't deal with the fact that he had broken his word that he was going to never deny Jesus. And so John chapter 20 gives us, or 21, gives us our text here. And uh, basically, again, I'm going to tell you the story and we're going to read a few verses. Peter says, I'm going fishing. What he means by that is I'm going back to my old life. This religion thing, this following Jesus thing, it's not working for me. It didn't, somehow it didn't work for me because I thought that I was going to be stronger. 
maybe a lot of you can relate to that. He said, I'm going fishing, and the others said, we'll just go with you. Sounds like a good idea. That, that kind of tells us that a lot of times we think we're the only ones, but there's a lot of people that feel that way too. And they went fishing. They left, went out on the sea, uh, Galilee, Tiberias, and they fished all night long. And the Bible says they caught nothing, had nothing to show for it. And then as they're coming towards the seashore, they look and there's a man standing on the seashore. And he calls out to them, he says, have you caught anything? And they said, no. And he said, cast your net on the other side. And they did it. They cast it on the other side and this, this slew of fish filled the nets. Well, when that happened, they had seen that happen before with Jesus. And one of them said, It's Jesus! Remember, he'd been crucified, he'd been in the grave, and they'd seen two appearances of him, but they were still shaky about this whole thing that he'd been alive. So when, they, when Peter heard him say, It's Jesus, he jumped out of the boat and beat the rest of them to land. They come on in to land on the boat. So when they all get there, they look and Jesus has got this fire going with fish on it. And he says to them, come and eat breakfast. And there at that breakfast that morning, Peter got his duo. He got that moment, that experience, that we all need and long for a duo. And so that's sort of how the story went. Uh, you see, Jesus can give anyone a duo, even a guy who's failed, even a guy who's made big bugs, or maybe a guy who's never been interested, or maybe somebody who's lived their own way and, and thought everything was cool between them and God. He can give anyone a do-over. Do-overs are what Easter is all about. And I want you to know today, He's already started it for you. He's already started it. Because Jesus went looking for people the other disciples. He knew where they were, but he went to them. And I want you to know, you're not here today by mistake or by accident. He's already started with you. We see in the story that, that Peter was on the verge of this do-over when Jesus found him. And I believe today there's some people in here, you're on the verge of a do-over. He's found you today. Not only has he found you here, but he's found you under the preaching of the gospel. He's found you by speaking to you already through music or through something that's been said. He's found you. I, I love what Isaiah says. He says, I am about to do something new. See, I have already begun. Do you not see it? I've already started it. The very fact that you're here means he's already started it with you. The very fact that God's talking to us today is he's already started it. And, and it's not about uh, you, you can be a long-time church member or a no-time church member. That, that's not the point. He's already wanting to do something new in your life. So Jesus found them on the seashore. You see, he's always looking. For us, Jesus loves uh, people. When he came to this earth, he came to the common people. Amen. Luke chapter 15 uh, and five, uh, verse 3 and 4, uh, from the end of verse 4, he tells this story. He said, if a man, if a man had a hundred sheep and one of them gets lost, what will he do? 
Won't he leave the 99 others in the wilderness and go and search for the one that is lost until he finds him? That tells us that that one is important. And when he has found it, he joyfully carries it on his shoulders and comes back and he tells his friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me because I have found my lost sheep. He says, in the same way, there is more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents. Repent just means turns around and returns to God. Makes his do of it. And over 99 others who are righteous and haven't strayed away. And it's not that the righteous aren't important, but he's so concerned over the in individuals who are away from him who do not know him, who are struggling with life's guilt and pain like Peter was. So Jesus finds us. You're important that he's, he, you're on the verge of a do-over because Jesus has found you. Secondly, you're on the verge of a do-over because Jesus wants to feed you. You see, everything they needed when they were out on that sea fishing all night long, he had for them at the shore. I mean, if you fished all night long, you had a long night. I don't know about you guys, but if I drive at night, man, I ain't hungry all night long. I want to eat. I'm hungry. But when that, uh, our first trip to Fidget Forge, uh, after we were married, Tammy and I went to Fidget Forge, and we uh, got there in the middle of the night, <coughs> and we slept in a parking lot across from the Shoney's in, in uh, Pigeon Forge. No, it wasn't good. But I was sitting there and the sun was coming up. I was miserable. been a no night sleep, no sleep that night uh, because it was so uncomfortable. And I saw the Shoney's light come on. I said, let's go. We're going to eat breakfast. <laughs> that's what I, you know, that's just sort of where it was. They had been all night long. And he said, come and have breakfast. But you know, not only did he feed them physically, he gave them what else they needed. I want you to know, he wants to give you everything you need today. He'll give you fellowship and intimacy. He'll give you peace with God. That you're no longer an outcast, or you're no longer on the run from him, you're no longer trying to put things off. You are at total peace with God. You're at peace with death. You're at peace with, with what's going on in your life. Now, you may still have some bad circumstances, but you're at peace with it. But knowing that God's going to work it out. You see, He's got everything you need. He's got all the love. He's got all the forgiveness. He's got all the cleansing. He's got all the restoration. He's got everything that you need. God loves you. He desires to have a close fellowship. Well, Peter being the leader of the group, I'm sure he felt that his leadership of the group, his ministry, his service was over, that he'd no longer be in that place anymore. Sometimes we get away from the Lord, and we get away from serving Him in the church, and we think, well, I can go back to that. A lot of times we do it when we're young, but then we kind of get out and get away. And we think, oh, I could never be that person again. That must have been how Peter felt. But I want you to read with me verses 15 through 17. I'm going to have that out of here about five minutes. He said, after breakfast, Jesus asked Simon, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than me? Yes, Peter replied, you know I love you. He says, to feed my lambs. Serve me. And Jesus repeated the question, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord. You know I love you. He said, then take care of my sheep. And a third time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt that Jesus was asking the third time. Said, Lord, 
do no error. Now this was the man that argued with Jesus about faith, about the nine. Lord, you know everything, and you know that I love you. And Jesus said, the same you. You know what was taking place right there? For those three denials, there were three uh, questions of love and three statements of service. Jesus was recommissioning Peter in life of ministry. He was saying not only will it uh, be better than it was in the past, you've got a future. We don't have the scripture up. Let me tell you, but he tells them, always this is the kind of death you're going to die. You're going to serve me. And then the final thing he says to Peter in verse 19 is, follow me. And that's interesting because when Jesus walked along the seashore, and the first time he saw Peter, he was walking along the seashore. Peter was mending nets. He was a fisherman by trade. And Jesus walked up and said, follow me. Now, after his denial, you know what Jesus says to him? Follow me. I believe today he's still giving us the same message. You see, God doesn't change his will for us. God doesn't change his desire to know us. None of that changes. We think that our mistakes and our sins and our circumstances change all that. Friend, I want you to know God still has a will. He wants you to know Him. He wants you to follow Him. None of that's changed. And the do-over is when you experience that He's still willing to call you son. He still wants to have a relationship with you. It's not changed. Jesus, uh, Jesus set Peter free from failure and sin of the past. Even though Peter had declared, I'll never deny. Let me close with a couple of verses of Scripture. 2 Corinthians 5 17 says this that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone, the new has come. David's your new person. You have a new life. All those you and know the Lord. You have a new life. Now some of us sometimes, we slip back into our old life, sort of like what Peter was doing. But he finds you. He's done this morning. And he says to you, come back. Have breakfast. I've got what you need. I've got a place for you in my kingdom. Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 11 says this, For I know the plans I have for you. Says the Lord, They are plans for good and not for disaster. To give you a future and a hope. See, God's plans for you have never changed. He wants to know. He wants to have sweet, intimate fellowship with 